Hello. Welcome to Books and Brews. The place where beer and literature meet. With your host, certified Cicerone, Michael Agnew. And Laura Mosica, author of The Blue Bells Chronicles. Each month we invite a guest author to read their words and talk about writing while sipping beer is specially paired with their work. This month we talk with Sarah Stonich. So sit back, pop a cold one, and dive into some books and brews. All right, are you ready to go? Let's do this. So, everybody, welcome to episode, number what are we eight. on, eight? We are on number eight. Uh, who's our guest? Our guest is Sarah Stonich. She is the author of multiple books. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, welcome. welcome. Thank you. Thanks. So, how's your month been? My month has been good. I did my annual uh, trek to Utah, southern Utah, mm-hmm. uh, which is always awesome. I was awesome. under the impression that you went more recently than last November, or is time going I just went last? last week. Well, I know, I know, <laughs> but I mean before that. I thought you had gone like in June or April or May or something. No, I, I would like to be able to okay. squeeze in a trip in the spring. So what uh, you're saying is my year has gone that fast. Your year has gone that fast. That it seems like just been six months ago through. that you told me you were in Utah and then you were again. Yeah, Not, and, and how was Utah? Is, it's the same place every time you go, isn't uh, it? No, I go all over southern Utah. Oh, I mean, it's always okay. southern Utah. Okay. But, uh, in fact, this year I went to uh, an area called Cedar Mesa, mm-hmm. which is in the southeast corner. Um, and I've been going there almost every year for close to 25 years, and somehow mm-hmm. I have never spent time in that area. <laughs> and how, how did this come to your attention? Uh, I did some hikes near there last year uh-huh. and thought, why haven't I come here? So I said, so I have. And yeah. the great thing about all the trails there uh, lead to uh, Anasazi ruins. So, oh, oh, really? Uh, you know, you hike out five or six miles and you come to these great, really well-preserved, you know, 1,200-year-old Mm-hmm. Uh, Anasazi ruins, mm-hmm. and it's so much fun. I'm going to have to oh. look into that. I've been wanting to go back. I think it was two years ago, 2017. I was there on my way to my son's graduation from um, MCRD in mm-hmm. San Diego. Uh, he's a Marine, and I loved it. First time mm-hmm. I've ever been to Utah or the Southwest at all. I loved it. So I'm going to put that on my to-do list. No, to it is gorgeous. Back. Yeah. Uh, the first day, so <laughs> it was a cold snap everywhere in the country, obviously, but the first day we were there, we were supposed to do hiking, and when we woke up, uh, it was uh, 14 degrees with a minus 12 wind chill. Oh my God. <laughs> so we didn't do hiking I, that morning. Uh, didn't expect that in the Southwest. <laughs> oh, it gets cold there. Uh, it's not usually that cold this yeah. time of year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was... That was bitter. So we did some driving stuff that day. We went to uh, Monument Valley and Valley of the Gods, and uh, we did squeeze in a hike late in the afternoon. Did it warm up later? Yeah, I never got out of the 20s that day. But the thing is, out there, the sun is really intense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the 20s feels more like the 30s here, or if it doesn't get out of the 30s, you're in shirt sleeves. Right. By, yeah. by well, whereas by comparison, when I was in Scotland and it was sixty the whole time, I was dressed in seven layers, yeah. and it felt like about thirty-five when it was sixty there. Yeah. So, what about your month? Yeah, my my month has been uh, a lot of reading, a lot of catching up with practicing harp and flute and guitar. I have to play for Christmas mass. I, I shouldn't say I have to. I should say I, I get can. to. <laughs> I have to play. And I you sound like fun. my actors. You sound like my actors. They're always like, I have to do three scenes in this show. Yeah, I know. I, I tell my students, what do you want me to play the piano? I'm not here to work. You play the piano, kid. Um, no, the, the big excitement for this month is one of my twins got a car. So I can't believe they're 17, mm. almost 18. So he got himself a car so he can go pick his sister up from work. He can drive himself wherever he wants to go. So... That's very exciting. Um, but as I said, I've been doing a lot of reading. What you been reading? <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> um, I would say I read 
Sarah's book, but I actually read it about four or five months ago when you sent it to me. Reread some of it now. So let's see. This is kind of exciting. I have here, I'm holding it up for the camera so our, you know, 2.9 million listeners can see it, of course. That webcam that we have right, running right around. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Which is somewhere. where again? <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll post a picture. This is um, a kind of cool book for me. It's a children's book, but it's called Tom's Midnight Garden. It's by Philippa Pierce. And it was written probably 60 years ago. And the reason I read it was because it is the book that inspired Margaret Anderson to write In the Keep of Time, which is also a children's novel. And her book is a big part of what inspired my books. Uh, the Bluebells Chronicle, shameless plug there. So anyway, it was kind of a neat story. It was fun to read. It was fun mm -hmm. to see what inspired her. <laughs> And then um, I did some light reading, Aquinas in 50 Pages by Tyler Marshall. And indeed, he did cover Aquinas in 50 pages, right. plus the front material. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also finally got around to reading a book by uh, one of our prior guests, actually. Uh, we were speaking just when you got here about who's been on the program. Chris Powell, I think, was the second guest. Back in the radio back, days. Back in the radio days, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so his book is called The Path That Shines, A Story of Life, Love, and Loss, and that is about the illness and um, eventual loss of his wife, and so that was um, a very profound and poignant book to read. Nice. And um, yeah, a lot of reading. How about you? I've been reading a really uh, frightening book to read. <laughs> I've been reading Poisoner in Chief. Oh. Uh, it is the story of Sidney Gottlieb, who was the person in charge of uh, MK Ultra, the oh, CIA's mind control program in the mm -hmm. 1950s into the 1960s. Uh, so it's all about um, you know the CIA's quest to control minds and implant and destroy memories in the during the Cold War. Um, and the crazy things, that they, like frightening things that they did. I've like been hearing a lot about LSD it testing. It, so mm. Scott was convinced that LSD was the key to mind control. And so they used it insanely and like gave it to completely unsuspecting, ordinary American citizens. Just uh, there's one story that it's not confirmed, but there's an entire village in France that one day kind of went crazy. Um, and Gottlieb and some other folks just happened to be there. <laughs> oh my God. Something in the water supply? Um, they had uh, safe houses all over the U.S. where they would uh, invite people up um, and give them LSD without them knowing. Uh, they had what do, another. What do they do? Put it in the food or the drink? Or yeah, or drinks. How does that work? Uh, it, okay. it takes very little LSD okay. to, to send you off, okay. uh, and so you can just put it in a drink. Um, they had one safe house where they were doing experiments, giving people LSD, and then they hired uh, prostitutes. So they'd give them LSD and then have watched them having sex with prostitutes. Um, nice guy. They had uh, safe houses or like secret black sites all over the world where they would do expendables. They had like Chinese and Russian and whatnot prisoners who were expendables that they would do intense interrogations on that frequently ended up in them dying. Uh, and this is the U.S. government. This is the CIA, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it was a secret, super secret program, even within the CIA, only a handful of people knew what was going on in it. And then at the end of it, when it was disbanded, uh, Gottlieb ordered that all records of it be destroyed. So how do they know about it? Uh, they're, you know, some bits and pieces scattered out in it. other places okay. in the CIA. Okay. Um, at some point, Congress got wind of it, and mm -hmm. uh, folks were called in to testify in open hearings. And it was, it's like, yeah. <laughs> wow. The things that happen that we find out about. <laughs> yeah. So our guest today is Sarah Stonich. And uh, let me give an intro here. Sarah's first novel, These Granite Islands, was awarded a Loft McKnight Award, a Friends of American Writers Award, and was a Barnes & Noble Great New Writers Pick, among other awards. That novel was translated, I've seen actually, into eight and into 11 languages. 
in different sources. Yeah, okay. I have two. <laughs> I'm, do you, do you I'm know? pretty sure it's 11. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What are some of them? Oh, um, French, Dutch, German, Spanish, Italian, Greek, mm -hmm. which was nice to see my, it in a different alphabet. Yeah. Um, Portuguese, mm -hmm. uh, Swedish, so we're past Norwegian, da point. and Danish, and one night. Okay. I, I, yeah, I'm, it's a lot of languages. Yes. Her second, The Ice Chorus, was also widely translated. Her memoir, Shelter, Off the Grid in the Mostly Magnetic North, won a Northeast Minnesota Book Award. Her feminist trilogy, Fishing with Rayanne, originally written under the pen name Ava Finch, is being reissued by the University of Minnesota Press. She is currently adapting that series for television as well as writing original screenplays. Her Northern trilogy, beginning with Vacation Land, continues with Laurentian Divide, which won the 2019 Minnesota Book Award and the NEMBA Award. What is NEMBA? Northeast Minnesota Book Award. Okay, okay. As well as being a 2019 National Reading Group Month selection by National Women's Book Association. In March 2020, Wisconsin Public Radio International's Chapter a Day will feature Laurentian Divide. Uh, Vacation Land has been chosen as a community reads in two dozen Midwestern and Canadian cities. Sarah is currently researching and writing the final volume of the Northern Trilogy, Watershed. Sarah has been awarded fellowships at the Tyrone Guthrie Center in Ireland, Gibraltar Center, Toronto, Hawthornden, Scotland, Art Omi, Omi? What do you say? Oh my, I think. Art oh my. Yes. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> oh my, I slaughtered that pronunciation. New York and Chicago's Raydale <clears throat> Foundation. One more sentence on the next page. Sarah lives in Minneapolis on the Mississippi River in a renovated flour mill with her husband, musician John Ware. And I have to ask, of course, being a musician, what instrument? Guitar. Guitar. Okay. Many uh, guitars. Yeah. Many gu <laughs> yes. That's the way it is with guitar players. Yeah. They, they never they need a library. just one. Yes. They keep showing up and they mm -hmm. keep not leaving. Yeah. Well, I, you're saying that like it's a bad thing. Oh, no. It's, it's great. <laughs> he could be bringing home worse things than guitars. I, I was going to say I kind of do the same. You know, I've got three harps. I've got... All kinds of stuff. I, harps, I three harps, I take up a lot of room. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a different category. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I've got probably about 45 to 50 instruments at this point. Some of them are very small. Some of them are very large, like the grand piano and a yeah. very big organ. So anyway, let's get on to the first reading. Yeah. And I what, think, what beer? I think okay. with this uh, set of readings, it would be good if you would just introduce the book a little bit. Okay. Um, um, you know what? I think it, now you're jumping the gun on my questions. Okay, uh, well, I just thought it would be can, helpful. Can but... you give an overview of the book? Yeah, of the whole trilogy, of the trilogy, my northern trilogy. Yes, um, it's a community in northern Minnesota mm -hmm. um, called oh, by the Boundary Hatches Waters in Inlet. Right? Well, supposedly okay, by the Boundary so Waters. I don't name my places. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that later. Um, but it um, started out with a resort called Naledi Lodge. Mm -hmm. And the first book, Vacation Land, has interconnecting chapters, stories, with about 15 characters. Mm -hmm. um, and it's from the conception of the resort through the present, which and what, at this point it's now only two cabins left, mm -hmm. and the prodigal granddaughter is the only person living there. Um, but in the interim, between the time it began and, and now, um, it's about all of the people who've come and gone, the repeat, you know, customers, mm -hmm. the people who work there. Um, I, I wanted to write about Minnesotans in a more realistic way. Mm -hmm. It was like, not all my men are uh, <laughs> good looking and all, not all my children are above average. Um, and I wanted to kind of break that Minnesota nice stereotype mm -hmm. and write about the actual people. And a lot gets written about northern Minnesota, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but very little gets written about life there. Okay. So it's about life in northern okay. Minnesota. Just yes. Basically where politics and industry and recreation kind of meet mm -hmm. and the dichotomies there. And 
okay. how people react, react to it. All right. So I just thought that would be helpful to, to leading into these readings and yeah. the beers that I chose. Uh, so your first reading, uh, the image that really stood out to me was uh, the the character Alpo and is it Tomas or Thomas or Tomas? Tom, Tomas. That's yes. how I read it. T O M A S. Yes. Um, so there's a recollection of that this passing of that friendship and mm-hmm. the, the image from that that stood out to me was the two of them having beers, mm-hmm. um, and I just pictured them throughout the course of that friend the whole course of that friendship that being a recurring event and probably sitting in a small town bar in the arrowhead somewhere um and so it had to be a light lager and it should be local so i picked the minnesota beer green belt premium all right um it's something that i could <laughs> see that easily see them sitting at the bar with long necks of uh primo uh mm-hmm. Doing what friends do. Right. What guy friends do. do. Huh? <laughs> so, cheers. cheers. <clears throat> well, are you that's, a beer drinker? Oh, well, I've been a beer drinker <laughs> since I was probably about four. All right. Oh, uh, <laughs> me too. Me I, too. I mean, I remember my grandfather pouring us our own, we had our own little beer stuff. Oh, you're not mm-hmm. kidding. No, I'm not kidding. Okay. My dad yeah. just gave me sips of his beers. Yeah, no, we got the whole deal. And, right. and here I was in Germany, and I'm the one who wasn't drinking beer yeah. at that age. I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> well, we do have an infamous picture where the bottle's tipped over, but I think they kind of staged that. Yeah. So, go ahead. Your first reading. My first reading mm-hmm. is about Alpo, as you, as you said. Alpo unrolls the folded canvas hoses on the fire truck, turns them on for a quick fill, and checks for leaks and wear. Done, he uses the water to hose winter grime from the planters made of truck tires that edge the station lawn. The ground is flax dry on the surface, but spongy and cold underneath. He rewinds the hoses, making sure the bearings are oiled. Machinery is absolute, nothing so fallible as a girl's arm. Admittedly, like Pete, Elpo thinks too much lately. Not because he has too much time on his hands. His hands are actually quite occupied, as the only volunteer who maintains equipment. His duty at the station is a litany of brief tasks that take all of an hour each shift. A romp compared to tending the mining machinery he was once responsible for. Here, it's mostly just checking and rechecking. Also, Elpo tinkers. Since people know he's here and can fix things, They bring him their broken toasters, electric can openers, sewing machines, and dust busters. He's happy to oblige, drawn to the sort of mechanical minutia that require dainty tools and little patience. It's meditative, fixing a snagged bobbin case or wonky hoover cords, and he sleeps like a baby, knowing his work won't result in any OSHA disasters. Now that he's retired, his thoughts are supposed to be his own, But what they do is tug him around as if on a leash. The theme over the past week has has tended toward toward choices, those he has made and those he didn't. What if he had taken another path, considered other options? Regret is too strong a word. He actually has very few. One pops up like a cowlick. That he'd settled for the mines when he could have become a mechanical engineer maybe seen more of the world. He had a chum back in high school, Tommy Mahutava. Alpo didn't see much of him outside of school because Tommy lived out at Naledi and worked the resort all summer for his old man. They'd been on the same team in applied science class and wrote a paper together about the invention of television based on the aha moment Philo Farnsworth had while watching a field being plowed the inspiration from which sprung his patent for an image dissector, photo tube, and subsequently television tubes. Their instructor, Mr. Urho, knew exactly what he was doing when he took each boy aside and told him he was the first in class, but would need to hustle to keep his lead. It worked. Both Alpo and Tommy dug in to compete, fierce but friendly. They shared similar aptitudes and both had drive. 
the big difference being that when it mattered most, crusty old Vach tutored Tommy in algebra and helped him apply for a scholarship to a prep school in Lake Forest, Illinois. Elpo's own father got off of his bar stool long enough to march him down to the Shell station, where there was an opening for a mechanic's assistant. The prevailing tide in Hatchet Inlet in the 60s was that the mines were good enough, that logging and outfitting were good enough, and that aspiring to more suggested attitude. Once Tomas went away, Alpo at least got Ruthie Amundsen, the girl they'd both been crazy for. He envied Tomas for his ivied school where learning was revered, where shirt cuffs stayed clean. He imagined his own hands working a slide rule instead of dismantling carburetors. Inevitably, Tomas's next step was a good university, while Alpo's was a two-year stint at Votech. After starting at Gulliver Mind, Alpo saw Tomas only once or twice a year when he was home on break from Caltech. They'd have a drink, talk fishing or girls, but avoided topics of work or study, the gap in their futures already too wide to bridge. Vietnam was the static background on radio and television. Since wars need steel, work at the mine went into high gear, pulling ore to make choppers and jeeps and weaponry, Alpo assumed. When the topic of their mutual deferments came up, Tomas vaguely mentioned working on something for the government and had been recruited by an engineering firm in the Pacific Rim. Alpo met Rose, got promoted. There was less, less leisure for a beer with Tomas at the duck blind, not that he was home often, and by then he'd married Anne. After the war, Tomas took an offer from a firm in Chicago that built bridges and bought a house in a leafy suburb. Alpo buried his father and moved Rose into the Lottie homestead in time for Candy to be born. Life happened. He couldn't say why he felt more guilt than grief when Tomas's plane went down. His little daughter Meg already looked like an orphan with her curls and Annie freckles. It was hard to fathom a motherless girl with only the company of old Vac. Alpo sighs. Yes, there are things he'd like to do differently. He dribs tiny orbs of three-in-one oil onto the flywheel of a Kenmore, pushes his chair back to stand and stretch. Though the fire hall is a volunteer gig, he sets a schedule. Lunch is from 12.30 to 1.15. He never peeks into the lunchbox because Sissy asks him not to. Today it's cabbage rolls and coleslaw in case he wasn't getting enough cabbage. But that's Sissy. If cabbage is on sale, then cabbage is what's cooking. Very nice. So, um... <clears throat> I think you actually cut this short from what you sent us, didn't you? Oh, I can continue. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. It seemed well, like I was going on and on. It's good. All right, if well, it's good. It's it's just that the questions I had... Oh, well, let um, me then go on. <laughs> I shall. Read, read I shall just continue. the last part about Rose and the books. Ah, yes. Alpo thinks of Rose's many books and size. He'll have to ask Pete to sort them and take what he wants and donate or sell the rest. He won't bother Candy, who won't stand for the clutter of books in her modern box of a house, where she and dentist Dennis, she begs Alpo not to call him that, are raising his youngest grandchildren, pretty Maisie and peevish, peevish Paul. Rose would say the key to a person's character is there on their bookshelves, but Alpo has his doubts. How many actually get read, and how many are for show? Alpo, Rory is a bookworm, but what kind? He'd been one of those quietly philosophical, philosophical types all these years. Does he read to escape reality, his past? Has he been out there all this time wrestling with a poet's heart? As Alpo rinses the Tupperware and sets it on the drain board, he realizes how little he knows. So I'm going to focus in just on a couple of the questions I had. This this is actually big to me, this contrast between Alpo and Rose, that she's very into reading. And there is a section in there where you talk about how she keeps the treasured books on the glass tin case, and yet here mm -hmm. he's a guy who's, you know, his whole life has been the minds are good enough, is what he's been taught. And um, he's thinking about what are the biggest 
why, why people read. What do you think is the biggest reason people read? And what makes a great book that people want to read? Well, I know why I read. Um, and that's, from a, from a very young age, that would have been to escape my circumstances mm-hmm. and reality and, you know, growing up having five brothers and sisters in a crowded house mm-hmm. and books were quiet. The books were a quiet place to go mm-hmm. where things happened. Mm-hmm. And at home, it was just school, home, school, home, school, uh, home. So went, it opened a different world. It, it was a completely different world beyond okay. the nuns and the brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. And yeah. what do you think makes a great book, the, the kind that people want to read over and over? I, oh, transformative um, scenes and place, memorable places mm-hmm. and people that, characters that, that one can relate to more than anything else. I think it's the characters. Mm-hmm. The story to me is always secondary. To the characters. To the characters. Right. Yeah, it's, um, it's funny you say that you think of someone like Miss Havisham. You know, mm. there is someone memorable. Mm-hmm. Um, I can still see her sitting in the bride's gown with the moldy yes. cake, and who can forget that? It's always interesting and, to me talking to writers whether the approach they take, whether it's the uh, a character driven or a plot driven or something else that that drives it. So for you, it's it's everything revolves and comes out of who the characters are. Very much, but also place. But uh, in my in my experience as a writer, place has almost become a character for me. Well, it's Naledi Lodge, right. Northern Minnesota. Um, it is a character to me. It um, really shapes who they are. It shapes who you are. And, and it drives it what happens. it certainly shaped who I was. Mm-hmm. Now, you grew up on the Iron Range, right? I grew up in Duluth, but spent my summers in Ely. Okay. What, what school only... were you at in Duluth? Pardon? What school were you at? Um, in Duluth, yeah. I was in I was in many schools. Being okay. dyslexic, I kept starting and dropping out, starting and dropping out. Um, I went to St. Rose of Lima in Proctor. Okay. Um, I went to Proctor High School, Proctor mm-hmm. Junior High, Proctor High School, Denfeld High School. Moved down here, did Marshall University High School, Central High School. Um, yeah, I hopped around a lot to a okay. lot of schools before dropping out in eleventh okay. grade. So I dro- I'm a I'm a high school dropout. <laughs> Who's a writer? <laughs> Who is a writer? Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I think that we better go on to beer number two. Okay. And reading number two. Yes. Um, so this next reading uh, takes place at the lodge. Um, it's, it's actually a flashback. Yes. Uh, I get summer at the lodge. Um, and so the images that popped into my head were of, you know, pine trees and, and, uh, white birch, um, and the forest and the, the lake shore. Uh, and so I was really trying to, to pick a beer that, that kind of captures that kind of place. Uh, and again, it's a local, local, cause this is very local focus. Like you said, mm-hmm. place is a character. Uh, so this is Summit's uh, Great Northern Porter. Hmm. Um, porters are a beer that you could drink up there in the winter or the summer. People think of mm-hmm. like the black beers as winter beers, but they're really not. You can drink them any time of year. Uh, but to me, it just said pine trees and birch. <laughs> well, right. we'll see what it says yep. to me. <laughs> this looks Cheers. already like what I'm going to like. Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh, it's woody. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's very good. I like that. Mm. I don't usually like darker. Do you like this very one? Very dark. Um, I like it better than the grain belt. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not, not too hard there. <laughs> trying to be polite here. No, it's, it's, I do like it better than the grain belt. I don't like it as much as, say, the old fudge. Or what, what was the one that I really liked? Uh, you liked like the Lee's Harvest Ale. That's right. I wrote that down. Yeah. So uh, this one, flashback to Pete meets Meg. And just to put this, uh, set the scene, Pete is Alpo's son. Son, yes. So this is when Pete is seven. Seven years old. Wipe that off the window, please, his father said. And next time use a tissue. Pete tucked the offending finger into his sweatshirt sleeve and frowned. I don't got any tissue don't have any tissue, his father corrected, shifting to pull a handkerchief from his hip pocket. 
But Pete was already grinding the snot across the passenger window with a cuff pulled over the heel of his grubby hand. Great, Elbow exhaled. This drive is boring. When will we get to swim? Pete's finger was auguring again, and his heels whacked the bench seat. How much longer? Elpo reached over and tugged Pete's hand from his nose. Leave it. Ten minutes tops. And do not tell me you have to pee. And no, you can't swim. It's too cold yet. It is not. Besides, you didn't bring trunks. Pete sulked as the road narrowed. Ahead was a series of signs for the resort, planted one after another, Burma shave style. Elpo pointed. Can you read those? Pete glanced out the pickup window. Yep. Can you read them out loud? With as world-weary a tone a seven-year-old could muster, Pete read, Vacation land is getting nearer. Put your feet up and relax here, he sniffed. Land of sun and sky-blue water. Watch the deer and moose and otter. Pete nodded his head to the rhythm in spite of himself. Northern lights and peace aplenty. As they reached the arch, he frowned and finished robotically. Welcome, campers, to Naledi. That's good, son. Do you know what an exclamation point is? Yeah, Pete muttered, looking ahead at the string of cabins, his forehead furled in dismay. It's not a camp. No, it's a resort. Past the cabins stood the lodge, anchored on one corner by the tiny store. Bait, snacks, beer, pop nailed above the porch windows in twig letters. Pete pointed to the fiberglass arrowhead dairy cone. Can we get ice cream? We can get ice cream. Same, same, Pete sang. Same what? Two sentences, same words. Is that so? Rearranged, Pete watched his father think that over and tapped the window. Rearranged. He pressed into the bench seat. I don't want to play with some girl. Some girl might not want to play with you. Ever consider that? In the lodge, Pete's father turned him by the shoulders to a freckle-faced girl with eyes that didn't focus so much as take aim. This is Meg. He folded his arms but did not look away. Meg, this is Pete. Her own greeting was a mere shrug, but enough to send her curls bouncing, putting Pete in mind of slinkies, a head full of miniature slinkies, the color of the copper wire in his dad's workshop, all over this girl's head. Back sidled out from behind the bar, looked Pete over, nodded, opened the screen door, and said to both children, get some fresh air, as if they lacked it. His father followed, herding them to the play area. Vac stepped out to watch a moment, then disappeared inside. Alpo was just getting Meg poised on a seesaw when Vac was approaching, holding up two beers, indicating the bar with his thumb. Alpo reluctantly let go of Meg and nodded to Pete. Play, play nice now. Before his father reached the door, they'd abandoned the seesaw and ambled off. Near a cabin that was being cleaned, Pete was drawn to the radio flyer the maids pulled from cabin to cabin. Big girls, college girls with kerchiefs on their heads like Aunt Jemima on the syrup. Meg told him Vac fixed up the wagon by welding on racks to hold the mops and rags and cleaning supplies. A long dowel at the rear pointed up like a lance to spear a dozen rolls of toilet paper. A transistor radio attached to the rack was rigged with an antenna made of a coat hanger. When, Meg was, when Meg's back was turned, Pete stole a little bar of Camay for his mother. At the horseshoe run, three resort kids listlessly tossed bean bags, dressed almost identically. They were so bored, they invited Meg and Pete to a game of hide-and-seek. Neither made any attempt to hide, and as the countdown began, Meg offered a polite, no thank you, and in a show of ownership took Pete's hand to pull him along. I have a guest. There were better things to do than play. Pete followed Meg to the farthest cabins. Just as they rounded the corner, they heard a soft thud. A hummingbird had flown into the glass sky reflected in its windows. It lay on the path, its bodies inert on orange needles. It didn't even twitch when Pete held it. Its neck was hinged. It's broke, he held it out to Meg. 
She picked pine needles from it, and they examined the tiny corpse together, turning it every which way, watching its colors change in the light, gingerly tugging the wingtips to their full span. Its beak was surprisingly long and sharp. Even as he held it, Pete could feel the warmth draining from its body. Meg declared the number of tail feathers was uncountable, and while Pete was able to count beyond 500, he pretended he couldn't. They decided the rest of the body was covered in fur because they could not fathom feathers so small. They went off to look in the garbage bins for a box that might do as a coffin. They could only find an egg carton. After laying the little bird in it, they thought it looked too alone, surrounded by eleven empty spaces, and couldn't bring themselves to lower the lid. They set off to hunt for other dead things to keep it company. Meg found two minnows belly up in the bucket. She knew where there was a squash tree frog on the road. Eleven corpses was a tall order, so rather than keep searching, they decided it would be easier to find more living things and make them dead. They killed a worm, a leech, and a beetle. Neither relished the axe, but they were necessary. Then, having lost their appetite for blood, they decided a chicken bone counted, as did a handful of dead blue bottles from the fish house windowsill. The husk of a big spider harvested from a smaller spider's web gave them pause. When there were only two empty egg sections to go, they decided personal belongings would be fitting tributes. Pete dug in his pocket and produced a sticky watermelon jolly rancher, then helped Meg untangle one of the platoon of pearly plastic barrettes restraining her curls. The ceremony was brief because Meg knew no prayers other than the good night one. She haltingly recited, Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep, if I should die before I wake. Pete, now a phalanx of prayers in both English and Latin, learned in high mass his mother took him and his sister to on Sundays. Saturday mornings his mother went to confession, while his father would stand in the driveway, wrapped in a towel, and tersely wave them off. Saturday was Elpo's sauna day. Pete and Candy didn't go to confession. Their father forbade it. So on Saturdays they were allowed cartoons and Captain Crunch. By the time Sylvester the Cat and Roadrunner had worn themselves out, Pete and Candy would be sugar fraught and cranky. Their mother would return bright-eyed and forgiven, and their father would emerge from the sauna the color of an eraser. Pete knew the kitty prayer, too. He rushed in to join Meg. I pray the Lord my soul to take. They topped the little mound of earth with a popsicle stick cross. Meg led him through the boathouse, a blind box of chill after the bright sun. The walls amplified the sounds of water lapping at the interior walls. Pete didn't like it. Even his whisper was loud and echoing. I want to go back outside. Don't you want to see the boats? Meg was clearly disappointed, intent on showing off her territory. We sleep in here sometimes when it's real hot. Sleep here. Me and Vac on air mattresses, in the canoes. It's nice. As Pete's eyes adjusted to the darkness, the boathouse corners seemed a little less sinister. He could make out two wooden canoes bumping together and a few fishing boats. In one corner was an oddly bulged figure, like an alien, or one of the starving children in Africa from the commercials his mother wrote checks for. It was only an outboard motor clamped to a sawhorse. Just as he was saying, wait, Meg grabbed a snorkel from a hook and clomped to the far door to open to a sudden rectangle of daylight. He followed as she led him around the H of docks. Forgetting she was annoyed, she took his hand and tugged him to the end of the dock. They lay belly down on the boards with their heads and shoulders over the end, and Meg stuck her face in a snorkel mask. Her voice funny as she said, I'm going to see what's down there. I want to see what's down there. Pete knew what an exclamation point was. I went too far what, there. What I, <laughs> this, this selection really brought me back to our discussion, uh, Donna Isaac's poem last month mm-hmm. uh, called Unraveling About Childhood. And as I read this, I was wondering how much of this is based on your childhood. Um, spending a lot of time out, out of doors mm-hmm. on my own, mm-hmm. I would say, you know, okay. I, and I, again, you know, that sort of, 
nor the northern Minnesota landscape that mm-hmm. seems almost imprinted on me. Mm-hmm. I can't you know? It's kind of this right. Thing. Well, I, I lived in Duluth for three years, so yeah. I, I love that part right. of the world. Um, but I, I was the same even in Virginia. I lived there for three years, and I would spend a lot of time out in the woods with the yeah. dog and. Um, how did you get from being a high school dropout to writing novels? And how long have you been writing? Um, I was pretty much a late bloomer um, for various reasons and probably, you know, my reading challenges being one of them and writing challenges. Um, first, I was a visual artist mm-hmm. um, because mm-hmm. that's what my family thought I was <clears throat> going to be able to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's what I did for many years until I was 40. Okay. Um, but I, you know, I learned to read mm-hmm. and I taught myself more or less in my own way. Um, and then I taught myself to write and I did become a reader. I'm a very slow reader. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm a very slow writer. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it suits me more than, than visual art. Mm-hmm. Um, there's always the idea of you have a concept or an idea, or you have this creative urge um, and as a visual artist, I was very technically adroit at all of the things, you know, mm. skilled. Painter? Painter. Painting. Um, okay. But there was some, some glitch between what I had in my head and, and how things ended mm-hmm. up on the canvas. And I was never quite satisfied. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I did find um, that I was a storyteller and mm-hmm. had been. Even as a, a child, mm-hmm. I had imaginary friends. I had stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and... I finally got to the point where I was writing those things down. I have one question about this. Why third person present tense? That's a very unusual sort of tense to use. Why, why did you choose that? Um, just, just I, what I, I never No, I never know. And I don't know anything about writing. Okay. I know nothing about grammar. Uh-huh. I only know a sentence. I, I just, I read out loud. Okay. Um, and I do it until it sounds right to me. Okay. So this just sort of felt right to you. That just sort of felt right okay. to me. I mean, there's there's one first person um, story in Vacation Land, okay. and um, that that's so much easier to write. It's so much easier to write in first person. Uh-huh. I think I may do a novel well, I, in first I, person at some point. I do a little bit of that where I just sometimes I write in first person, and it's what seems right mm-hmm. for that scene, that character. I think we are ready for beer number three. Okay. <laughs> Which uh, means I have to bolt this one. <laughs> <laughs> so the, so the St. Paul Home Homebrewer, Homebrewers Club, their motto is, slam that, try this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so this next piece that you're going to read uh, is still, again, up north. Um, I pictured this in winter. And in fact, the image that I have in my head is of this snow-covered slope at the edge of a pine forest. It's probably an image that is more appropriate to some place in Colorado, but <laughs> <laughs> it's applicable, I think. Sure. So this is uh, called Tip Up Winter Ale. It's from Beaver Island Brewing in St. Cloud. This is a winter ale that is brewed with locally grown hops, spruce tips, and Ooh. a little bit of beechwood smoked malt. Wow. Uh, it is a whole lot going on in this beer. Uh, the smoke is pretty subtle. I was tasting it over the weekend. I had a friend in town this weekend, and when he tasted it, he said, even though it's dark and rich, uh, mm. it's like breathing outside on a cold day. So there's this mm. kind of you brisk... You winter sound good. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> there's both this kind of smoky, dark, roasty, toasty thing, and this kind of minty, brisk, fresh thing going All right, on in this I can't at the same time. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. I I do like that, and I can definitely tell that you're influencing me because I can guarantee two years ago I would not have. So I, you're, <laughs> you're, you're you're converting me. I believe right. you huh. did warn me that that would happen. I'm trying to make out the spruce tips. It's it's very so complex. Spruce, spruce it's really tips, it's quite good. Spruce expresses interestingly in beer it doesn't come off as piney as you might think it comes off more like blueberries almost it's a fruity it is fruity that comes from spruce tips that's quite good i drink drink a whole can of that yeah i usually for for these recordings i buy singles of 
of things, but I brought a six pack of that. Oh, very <laughs> nice. Can I see the can? Yeah. Tip up winter ale, Beaver Island. Where's Beaver Island? St. Cloud. St. Cloud. Not too far. Okay, am I reading? Mm-hmm. And uh, once again, to set the stage, Sissy is Alpo's fiance. They're going to be married in what? One days. Or two days at a this couple point. days. Yeah. The whole book takes place in the yeah. course of three days. Okay. Of course, she has a dozen things to do, probably two dozen, but as Sissy nears the Aurora Trail, she she sees the sign for Jasper Mushers. It occurs to her that the twins might know something about Rory. Other than to say hello, she doesn't know either twin well. They're rarely in town. Alpo had gone to school with them back when they were identical. Before your time, Alpo ribbed her, uh, as most things are. Fiddlesticks, she'd said. I remember princess phones, Alpo grunted. Sissy's glad he doesn't laugh at any little thing. He's no cheap date. He told her what he knew about Ronnie and Donnie Jasper, how they were tied for handsomest in the Wolverine's yearbook, had co-captained the hockey team. They married sisters Helen and Mary Knutson in a double ceremony. Bright, they could have gone anywhere, but stayed here, that old saw. They ran their father's Dodge dealership and built two houses across the road from each other like mirrors. Ronnie and Mary had three girls. Donnie and Helen had three boys. When the fourth set of babies were born, it looked like nobody could break the gender run, so they swapped girl for boy, and each brother raised the other's youngest, no questions asked. Until opening day of the 85 grouse season, you couldn't tell one from the other. After the accident, Ronnie's days on the showroom floor were over. Donnie ran the dealership until the recession hit. Ronnie did the books. Surgeries to rebuild his face nearly bankrupted them. Must have been awful for everyone, said Sissy. Mary gained a hundred pounds, said Alpo. Helen had an affair with the IGA produce driver. Each blamed their woes on the other's husband and quit speaking. Everybody got a divorce, and the kids swapped, got swapped back. The boy ended up in juvie at Red Wing, and when the girl wound up pregnant at 14, Donnie had a heart attack. Inseparable throughout, Ronnie had forgiven his brother for shooting him, even before the paramedics had him loaded into the ambulance, holding a handful of his own teeth. Donnie vowed to spend the rest of his life trying to make it up to Ronnie, and he had. The heart attack gave Ronnie a chance to take care of Donnie for a change. They sold the Dodge dealership, bought a ramshackle resort at the hind end of the Aurora Trail, and trained a brace of sled dogs. When that worked, they trained another. These days, Jasper Mushers gets featured in magazines like Outside and GQ, and their 12-day yurt-to-yurt luxury sled dog adventures make all the lists of things to do before you can't. If anyone had seen Rory over the winter, it would have been these closest neighbors. Since she's this far north, what's another few miles? She need only follow the sound. Huskies sing pretty and look pretty, but their bark is anything but. High-pitched and sharp, the sound multiplied like a serrated blade. Goodness, her own boy voice bar- barely registers. She slams her car door in hopes of announcing herself. Something's up. Donnie has isolated a single dog in a side pen. It's muzzled, one foreleg bloody. So are Donnie's hands. Oh, Donnie, that doesn't look good. What happened? Wolf. Broad daylight. Three young ones thought they'd go play with it. Their mama, in that next pen there, went after them. She's worse. Jeez, you called Pete? Only about 20 times. I'll try. She digs for her phone. Whatever he says is drowned out, but he points to the piney slope, flipping his thumb and pinky in the universal phone sign. He hollers, reception. She nods, heads back up the hill. Once her screen shows three bars, the call goes through fine, but the automated uh, automated message reports, the mailbox you've reached is full. Sissy finds Ronnie in a pen, sitting in the dirt, pinning a young male onto its back with his legs. The dog is kicking to get purchase, and Ronnie is pressing gauze to the under pocket of the hind leg. He looks up. He's not hideous, 
despite Joe's claim that looking at him makes a person want to chew their own cheek. Ronnie doesn't seem surprised to see her, but maybe surprise isn't in the range of his expressions. Well, thank God. Can you at least hand me that white tube? The dog is trying to squirm free. Oh, no, you don't. His tone softens when talking to the dog. We could use Dr. Pete about now, couldn't we, pal? He says it in a way that would do Pete good to hear. Sissy frowns over the open kit, a tray of grubby jars and first aid items, grabbing the first tube she sees and says, This one looks like super glue. More or less is. Still going to need stitches, but it'll do for now. The dog is wagging its tail. He's not in real pain. I numbed his belly. He thinks this is a game. She crouches and tilts. What can I do? Hold this together while I glue? His one eyebrow works fine. You up for that? Her jacket's already off and she's plowing her sweater sleeves. He lifts the gauze to reveal a seven or eight inch tear beginning near the dog's inner thigh. Superficial but nasty looking. The wound veers to the furred middle where the tear travels the penis casing to its very tip. Whoa, Sissy says. Ronnie nods. This guy's going to be pitching left from now on. He shows her where to hold and how hard. Once the glue is applied, his hands join hers. For a full minute, she barely breathes. Ronnie is muttering something like, shoo, 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 in a calming tone. For as long as he repeats it, the dog stays still. Her hands look small, budged in between Ronnie's. She's nodding along to his shoo, shoo, shoo. The belly flesh is warm, reminding her of something, a physical memory in her hands, the feeling of something similarly soft and aching for how distant it is, so near yet so far out of reach. Good work, Ronnie's voice brings her back. He eases his own hands away and hers trail after. That'll hold for now. What else can I do? He nods to the pen across and a spilled bucket just outside the chain link with a frozen, with a dozen frozen fishtails sticking out. The pen dogs are going crazy over the smells of fish and blood. They'll settle once they're fed. She picks up fish, paddle stiff, and hurls them one by one into the pens. After the initial frenzy, the dogs do calm some. When she reaches the pen with the lamed bitch, Ronnie rubs his face and walks over. Don't bother feeding her. She'll be put down. Oh? Oh, she thinks. Pete could save this dog. She looks Ronnie in the eye, saying quickly, Should I try calling again? Sure. Though most of Ronnie's mouth is scarred into a smile, he looks sad. Still no Pete. She leaves a message on the emergency line and tries the vet in Greenstone, who says he'll drive out. On the way back to the pens, she stops at her car to grab anything that might be useful. Ronnie and Donnie have gathered tools and have gone off to fix the fence so that the dogs might be let out again. She edges into the pen with the injured bitch. Only the lead dogs wear red collars. This girl is tawny and thin, one gray eye, one half blue. Her tag says Mensa. The break on her back leg looks clean, not so bad, but the ligament that holds it all together, the cruciate, has been torn through. Surgery for such an injury is complicated and expensive. There's amputation, but for a sled dog? This business is the Jasper brothers' livelihood, and these dogs aren't pets. This girl will be put down. The dog bears its teeth, but only half-heartedly. She is not going to to cry. Mensa, huh? You must be a smart one. Pulling the white package out of the bag, she waits for the dog to react, to sniff. Mensa's eyes fasten on the paper as it's torn away in a spiral, Sissy saying, I don't know about you, but when I'm not feeling good, some cold treat like ice cream or a popsicle always makes me feel better. The venison has started to thaw. When Sissy holds it out to Mensa, her black nose twitches and her ears prick. Very sad. Uh, It raises the question, do you have personal experience with dog (coughs) sled teams? Dogs. 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 My my daughter has a husky. She loves them. Yeah. Beautiful animal. Yeah. Yeah. And we visited, you know, my Mm -hmm. dad had friends who had 
opinions okay. and okay. so a little and bit. Yeah, they're not they're not pets. So this this brings <laughs> us to one of your other books. You have uh, how many five six books out? Something yeah. something like six, that. Something. Um, in 2017, you published a memoir called Shelter Off the Grid in this Mostly Magnetic North. Uh-huh. Tell our 2.9 <laughs> million listeners. Oh, a that many. Bit, yeah. At least. We're big. At least. Oh, we are. <laughs> it might be 2.95 million. Fabulous. Uh, the growth is slowing, you know, as we get bigger because there are only so many people left on planet Earth. But, um, <laughs> but tell our 2.9 million listeners a little bit about that book. It's a fascinating story. Well, um, it it is a memoir, and when I was a freshly divorced single mom, Mm -hmm. I thought it would be a good idea to take my city kid, Mm -hmm. who hadn't had the same experiences that I did, Mm -hmm. up to um, northern Minnesota and buy 40 acres of raw wilderness. Mm -hmm. Um, You thought? No, thinking (laughs) thinking that would be a great idea. Uh, And it was. Uh it was interesting to pull a 12-year-old away from civilization. Mm-hmm. and Actually, uh, that's sort of partially the premise of the book I'm writing right now. It's about a widow with five boys, and ah. she decides to buy a castle in nowhere Scotland. Ah. And uh, in her case, it turns out to be haunted, so mm. hopefully your cabin was not haunted. Well, yeah, we started it from scratch, okay, unless so. the timber was haunted. <laughs> okay. Anyway. So you um, built the cabin, we, too. Well, we had a builder, but, yeah. We, okay. And it was tiny, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, it was three little buildings. It was a tiny compound. Nice. And how long did you live there? Um, well, it was, a, it was intended to be my writing mm-hmm. space and our weekend cottage, mm-hmm. but um, because it was rustic, mm-hmm. you had to haul water and wood mm-hmm. and, and all of that. There wasn't a whole lot of time. Mm-hmm. It's one of those cabins where you get out of the car and you put your tool belt on and mm-hmm. that's and your weekend. So much for writing. And so much for writing. So I didn't get a whole lot. I, I, of course, I did write there, mm-hmm. but I didn't get a whole lot in. Um, now, of course, I, I go to other people's. The kindness of others <laughs> um, <laughs> provides me with many cabin days. I, I need to find some people like that. Yes. Well, also, I do dog sitting. Okay. Um, and so I which dog, you'll be doing in Scotland. Uh, which I did in Scotland last okay. fall mm-hmm. and, or last winter, and I will do again okay. uh, in British Columbia over this winter. But that book also brings into, um, it, it brings my family history into, um, I, don't, I don't like writing about my, myself. Mm-hmm. It was the hardest book I've ever written. I'll never write another <laughs> memoir. Or... Well, it's a good thing this one got out. Yeah, it we, just got out. Yeah. We are down to the last few minutes. Sarah, can you tell our two point? I think we're up to three million now. I think we gave <laughs> the last five minutes. minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I did say we are growing. Um, where, where can our three million listeners find you? Um, at sarahstonish.com. Okay, spell um, it out. S A R A H. S T O N I C H dot com. Okay. Do you have Twitter, Facebook? I do have anything? Twitter. I'm at Sarah Stonich mm-hmm. on Twitter. Um, I'm I have Sarah Stonich Bookshelf on Facebook. Okay. Um, and I list my events and new things that are happening there and what's coming up. And okay. I've just released this book in paperback, so I've just finished oh, a nice. tour. Okay. of um, the region, okay. and I'm still on that. Actually, this week I go to Cumberland, Wisconsin. Oh, this was good timing then. Yeah. It so was. Speaking of events, do yes. you have any events coming up uh, where people can find you? Cumberland, Wisconsin, and then there's uh, another <coughs> book out. That, when is that and where? That is Cumberland, um, Thursday this Thursday evening at 530 Okay, I guess you all that, won't be able to go to that because this won't, won't be out un- yet. Unless, well, <laughs> well, you're assuming they don't have time machine. Right. I mean, or that they live in Wisconsin. Right. Uh, so go ahead. You had others? Um, uh, the ones that I have coming up after that tend to be with an anthology that you guys might be really interested in okay. called Under Purple Skies. Minneapolis writers write about Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Under Purple Skies. And that's about to come out? It has been out for a short while. Um, I'm one of the contributing um, authors in it, at, and there's m- dozens. And yeah. Kevin Kling is one, and it's edited by Frank Burris, okay. who is a local writer and editor, and he put this anthology together. All right. I am at bluebellschronicles.com. Michael? I am at aperfectpint.net. And we yeah. are at booksandbrews.net. Uh, on Instagram, we are book. Mm, Bruce, B O O K, letter N, 
brews. And um, next month we have Lynn Miller La Crisier and the Lindy Lewis series. When Lindy's husband died, he left her with the Victorian mansion they had lovingly restored, only to find it infested with termites. The pest control <laughs> jokingly told her he may as well burn it and collect the insurance. So, so she did. The glamorous Lindy now travels the country with her million dollars in a shoebox pursued by the insurance fraud investigator who happens to be her former college boyfriend, Reed Connors. Lynn's 12 books are all adventure, suspense, and mystery, telling the stories not only of Lindy Lewis and Reed Connors, but of various residents of Birch Lake in northern Minnesota. So that is next week. Uh, next month. Next month. <laughs> next month. Whenever the next one is. Right. Um, Sarah, thank you for joining us thank today. Thank you for being here. Um, Thanks for having me. has been Episode 8 of Books and Brews Podcast. Thanks for listening. Bye.